and I hand over to Sia. You're welcome. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for staying on after the coffee and coming in in time. That is not uh, given uh, all the time, especially now that we uh, have heard such excellent speeches and perhaps we are filled with knowledge and can't cope anymore discussing the Orland Islands. But I think the president put it very nicely when he said that it's not a historic relic, it's something that we can use in the future, and I think this is a, an excellent entry point for this discussion in, in uh, this afternoon. And um, I have been communicating with uh, the distinguished speakers about some, some perspectives uh, that we can address, but first I would like to give the opportunity to, to the three of you, starting with uh, Deputy Minister Reid, by reflections about what you have heard so far, and if you, if you want to address questions. Uh, so far, so to speak. And, uh, and after Minister Rydberg, I think we should hear a little bit more to uh, Roger Nordlund, who has been in Hollandic politics for 40 years, so he okay. beats me in following Holland. Thank you very much. Well, my first reflection is that I think that uh, there is a uh, an absolute similarity between uh, Swedish and uh, Finnish uh, perspectives uh, about the importance uh, of the uh, Orland uh, Agreement. And I think also there is uh, an absolute uh, shared uh, view that this, uh, that this is a package, <clears throat> that there are uh, different elements, the sovereignty uh, issue, uh, the uh, issue uh, of uh, uh, self-determination, uh, cultural, uh, uh, linguistically uh, and uh, otherwise, and the aspect uh, of uh, demilitarization, that these three uh, aspects uh, go together uh, and have to be looked at uh, uh, in, their, uh, in their entirety. Uh, I, I also think that there is uh, an absolute uh, shared uh, view that this has uh, functioned uh, well, uh, it has provided uh, security and uh, stability uh, for uh, for a century. Uh, then, obviously, always there is a dev the devil is in the detail, uh, and I know that there is a discussion, negotiation uh, going on since some time. Uh, uh, between uh, between Finland uh, and uh, Orland about the implementation of certain uh, aspects uh, of the uh, of the regulations uh, but in my view uh, that does not in any way uh, imply uh, that uh, there is not uh, an absolute uh, consensus, an absolute consensus between Sweden, uh, Orland uh, and Finland uh, that this uh, agreement uh, remains valid and serves us uh, very well. And indeed, uh, Finland and um, Sweden used it practically in 1982 when, when uh, the ratification of the Law of the Sea Convention was um, uh, be done, uh, when Sweden and, and Finland refer to the demilitarization of the Orland Islands as, as the reason for uh, retaining a restrictive um, right to passage in the Sea of Orland, and that is something that unites also Sweden and Denmark, who did the same three thing through the Öresund. So I thought that it's interesting what you said about Mare Liberum, and uh, so this is part part of this uh, strategy of knowing who is going through in order to retain 
the, the idea of a mare liberum. But, but uh, now you have a, a ball struck over to your tennis court, uh, uh, Roger, because, uh, because Minister Rydberg said um, agreeing to disagree. Yes, but first of all, when I got the floor, I, I want to say thank you to all ambassadors and from the people from the diplomatic corps who are attending this seminar. Uh, this day is a very important day in our history. It was important what was decided 100 years ago. And as a matter of fact, it was the international society that uh, decided about the Åland destiny. So you hold up your, our destiny in your hands. And you still do, because this those treaties they rely on international le level and uh, i must say i all speeches and all presentations has, has been very fantastic here, here today and very interesting to listen to but for me as uh, deputy speaker of the parliament when i listened to president uh, saul Inistu, i was pleased, not to say delighted, because he has his president position as president of Finland today and he was also com commander for the for the defense of Finland. And he said that this regime it has grown in relevance. It's it remains robust and it's very important for this region and many many other wise things, exactly the things that we as Ålander want to hear. And, and, but feeling secure when a person in that position, the president of Finland, expresses that opinion about this regime, we can feel a little bit more secure. And having all you here today in our own parliament is also something that really is making us as Ålander no, politicians very, very pleased. So thank you very much for being here. I, I think it's really interesting what you're saying, Roger, and perhaps some of the ambassadors may be a little bit surprised by, by the fact that you emphasize uh, trust and security so much. Uh, one could, could imagine that a hundred years of relative uh, robust peace is enough to, to create this uh, sense of security in itself, but I think what you're saying is that trust needs to be remade uh, on and on. So if we then turn to this idea of trust as something that will need to be built up also in the future, uh, this is what you're saying. Um, so what would you expect of the wonderful ambassadors that we have here, and, and uh, of Mr. Rydberg. So, so what, what should we think ahead? Will you start and then we turn? Yes, I think you had a wonderful end in your speech, Sia. Then uh, you talk, talked about the, the old ladies and what they, their, their advice is. Old I, ladies I, are, are <laughs> always wise. Yes. <laughs> I think that is exactly what, what we want you to, to bring with you back to your embassies and to the message you we hope you will send to your home home countries and to inform them about this living regime and tell them that there is, as a matter of fact, a good example that can be shown for, for the rest of the world. And, uh, and if there is need for something now today, I think it, it is good examples to, to be find to be found so i think that is the most important thing today thank you would you like to continue you sweden also has a general consulate here so so there are different elements in the way um, sweden finland and Orland create this trust yeah. I could even broaden the picture to the uh, uh, Nordic region uh, as a whole, asking uh, uh, you uh, 
ambassadors to convey to your respective countries an understanding of what the uh, Nordic region uh, is uh, about. And I think it's useful to look at uh, history uh, also. Uh, there are no two European countries that have had uh, more wars uh, between themselves than Sweden uh, and Denmark. Uh, in 1905, uh, the uh, union uh, between Sweden uh, and uh, Norway was peacefully uh, uh, dissolved. We were at the brink of war. It was peacefully uh, uh, dis resolved. Another issue of the same character uh, as the uh, as the Orland Agreement. So, so this has historically, traditionally, not been uh, a region uh, of uh, of peace, love, uh, and understanding, but a region of uh, of different types uh, uh, of conflicts. But we have transformed it. We have transformed it uh, in an extremely uh, uh, fundamental way uh, to the degree that there are no European countries, no other countries, I, I would claim, that have a closer uh, relationship than these five uh, uh, Nordic countries. In spite of differences, three of the countries are uh, members of NATO, uh, two uh, are not, three uh, are members of the European Union, uh, uh, two uh, are not, one is using the uh, euro as a currency, uh, four are not. So in spite of very important uh, differences, uh, the relationship is extremely uh, close uh, between these uh, countries. And that's, uh, that's an asset, I think, for us. And I think it's an asset for, uh, if I may say so, for Europe as well. Mm -hmm. and, and now that uh, Sweden and, and Finland are cooperating more and more militarily, how do you guarantee the demilitarization and neutralization? How do you, or how do you strategize around it in a, the diplomatic sense? Well, Orland is demilitarized uh, and should remain so. And the fact that it is, uh, is an element uh, of, uh, of stability uh, in the uh, uh, Baltic uh, region. Uh, a region where tension uh, is uh, is growing uh, in a Europe where military force uh, are more than uh, for some time used also for uh, political uh, objectives. So I think it is also important that Sweden and Finland cooperate uh, in order to strengthen our capability, our ability uh, to respond if need be, uh, also by, uh, by military measures uh, in order to defend, uh, defend our security. So I see no, no contradiction uh, 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 between uh, that, between a better uh, military uh, readiness by uh, exercising uh, our forces uh, uh, jointly, by cooperating uh, on, uh, on military uh, equipment, etc., to be more uh, to be more capable. Uh, to uh, to defend ourselves, no one can expect, can uh, fear, can believe uh, 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 that uh, uh, Sweden and Finland uh, have uh, other uh, objectives than to defend uh, our uh, hard-won uh, uh, security, uh, independence, uh, right to determine our own uh, fate. Um, uh, Osa, you, you spoke about uh, European um, security cooperation, and, and uh, in one way one can say that security cooperation is one way of regionally 
cooperating. You, that was what you ended with, this regional cooperation. How do you see these different military alliances and um, cooperations, either ad hoc or institutionalized, in relation to de demilitarization? And what would you think, as a researcher, about the needs as regards uh, such um, uh, differentiating examples as the Orland solution is? Thank you. Uh, well, I think, uh, um, I mean, we have uh, mentioned, and I think it's uh, uh, quite obvious for everybody that uh, uh, multilateralism, in a way, under a threat today, it's often referred to that uh, the rules based uh, in, uh, international, uh, that uh, that a rules-based governing is under threat, so to speak, and we need to uh, to really uh, try to safeguard that. Uh, but I think, uh, concretely on your question, that in relation to military alliances, we, we have see a certain development in the EU, and we have, of course, NATO that we haven't discussed much today, uh, but I think it's important to continue to advocate this as a, uh, the regime as a, a stability enhancing factor, that it's not, uh, so to speak, uh, weakening such alliances and that it continue, can continue to uh, exist. Um, I also maybe would take this opportunity to... Um, to uh, um, introduce the word or the uh, concept transparency. That's what was came to mind when I heard your uh, your comments. And that um, I mean, the demilitarization regime can be seen as an early confidence building measures, and um, there are other such measures in a variety of fields within the OSCE, within in the disarmament fields, and. And it's always a very important aspect, uh, transparency. It can, it can be in the form of reporting, monitoring in different ways. Transparency, I think, also one could uh, um, emphasize the importance also in this case. It's important that we keep uh, that, so to speak, and uh, that we continue to, as you already said, to take care <laughs> of, our, of the demilitarization regime. Mm -hmm. So, so I'm sure you're you're um, worried a little bit about the the developments with regard to the open skies uh, agreement and and such transparency tools, and and we should perhaps also say that uh, apart from the Swedish general consulate, we also have a, a consulate of the Russian Federation on the Orland Islands, which is also a way of uh, of let's say using words and diplomacy instead of, of using uh, the, uh, military confrontation in, in uh, the, the oversight of the regime. How do you think about this paradox of transparency? I think uh, military affairs are not very transparent in general. I, I say so from the perspective of the, the Peace Institute and also as a researcher and at the same time the all on demilitarization is to be about transparency. How, how do we deal with this? Well, first of all, I happen to be head of the government here on Åland when the Open Skies Treaty was to be passed here in, in, in the Åland's lag thing in the parliament. And I must say that was one of the hardest times in my life because, because of this contradiction. Mm. So, but in the end, we were able to, to pass it and I don't think so. You have seen so many airplanes over in the sky. But it was a, a real hard debate here in Holland on that, in that issue. Mm. Uh, but uh, I think uh, it's very important to have an open dialogue, dialogue all the time. And when it comes to, to the marine in Finland, and especially the marine, we have had some discussions or headlines sometimes the and sometimes someone perhaps is trying to test the system and also some private person want to write something that we think is not not so good and we have to react on that 
on, and therefore the speech from the president today was so excellent and in favor of the, this regime. And with the Marine, I think to, to get those re regime to, to function, you cannot just leave them because they have, we, time is changing and development is ongoing. And with the Marine, we and have had a very good discussion and we have now avoided a lot of trouble because we have an open, open discussion with, with them every year. They send the plan over their visits to the Åland Islands, to the archipelago. And uh, so when an Ålander phoned the premier and tell her, oh, that we see a war vessel in, outside our island, is it okay? So you can look in the paper and say, yes, it's okay according to the plan, no, no problem. So no, no headlines in the newspaper. And I think that is the way one should handle things and uh, with, uh, with trust. And I must admit also that the military people, of course, they, they want to test the borders sometime, but they are also very strict and, and correct. They want to follow the, the law and the, 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 the regime. So that's also very good for us, I think. So there are practices, in addition to all these rules and articles that we discussed, there are practices that have developed um, in this learning by doing, uh, whereby the, the Finnish um, Marine reports planned visits, uh, both short term and, and long term, to the governor. Uh, isn't this how it works? And through the governor, it reaches also the government. Uh, and um, uh, moreover, it, it's a discussion in the parliament. Could you perhaps, uh, you have been the speaker of parliament for, for a long time, so the, the parliament discusses the militarization issues, so that is another local way of increasing transparency, isn't it? Yeah, that's, that is true, and I also, as you said, I have been almost 40 years here active in the political life in Holland, and this parliament, that usually is sitting here, which was elected two years ago. I think this parliament is the one that has, is most interested in the demilitarization and neutralization. I think the Secretary General and you have had many information for, for the, the new, new, new elected young um, par parliamentarians. And that is good because uh, if you don't upkeep the, the level of knowledge, then it falls down. And, and it is especially in our interest, we who are sitting here in this parliament, to, to be able to, <coughs> to know what the, the regime, what it means, and how to upkeep it. And uh, the, the government, which was led by Gunnell for, for the period 11 to 15, also Prepared, prepared a paper with guidelines for how to, to handle this, this question because they can be rather tricky sometimes for also civil servants. How should I handle this, this thing, this, this question and so on? But now we have good guidelines. You can look into them and see how to, to deal with them. So I, one have to, all the time you have to work with those questions. Guidelines for, for the local administration above all, but in effect it's also, I think, um, revealing a kind of an international agency. Orland does not have a formal standing as a party of the conventions, but takes its, its role seriously in a sense and interprets and applies and, and uh, thinks about this. So you did what the old lady said, think for yourself, uh, in a sense. <laughs> we try at least. <laughs> uh, but, but I was also wondering about uh, Europe and, and Sweden, that um, of course uh, we who have been following these questions, we know that there are great experts, um, and also in Europe, especially during the negotiations of um, entrance into the European Union, there was a lot of contact and discussion, but that was quite a long time ago. It's more than 25 years ago. And the experts, many of them are quite elderly. 
Um, and um, so how do we reach these younger, and how do we reach these uh, new power holders in the European Union? I think that one of the problems for Orland is, of course, that that uh, you are small, we have limited resources, uh, the Peace Institute is like six people barely, we cannot serve the world, now 193 countries or 6,000 languages. So how do we do it? How do you think, uh, Minister Rydberg? Well, I think there is uh, actually uh, an interest in uh, in Europe in experiences like the uh, Orland uh, experience. There are uh, a number, a growing number of uh, European uh, countries uh, today uh, where, for example, the uh, question of uh, cultural or uh, linguistic uh, minorities is uh, becoming a more uh, important uh, political uh, issue, uh, sometimes in a relatively dramatic way, in many cases uh, in a uh, in a more uh, more peaceful and well uh, organized uh, manner we have there are those who speak of Europe of the regions uh, for example where you will have more uh, cooperation between uh, adjoining uh, regions and not only between uh, uh, capitals and 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 nation uh, states so I think there there are elements uh, uh, there uh, that make uh, make the Orland uh, experience not something that can be uh, copied, uh, uh, obviously, but makes it uh, interesting and uh, and relevant as part uh, in the political debate uh, in more and more countries uh, in. Uh, uh, in Europe, and uh, it's good that you, it's good that uh, uh, your friends in uh, Finland, your friends in Sweden, and 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 and, and elsewhere, uh, also now and then uh, point uh, at these experiences. Of course, Sweden is a rather centralized country, so you don't have so much to lose. One would say. Also, much to gain. Uh, I, I, I don't think that uh, uh, regional, uh, cultural, uh, linguistic uh, diversity uh, is uh, is by nef definition something that that weakens uh, uh, the country. It can very well be uh, be an asset. Uh, also, but sure, there are there are major differences between Sweden and Finland. Also, in that uh, respect, we have uh, five recognized uh, uh, national uh, minorities, uh, uh, but they uh, uh, they live <coughs> spread out through the uh, through the territory. So the, the the question of linking that with uh, uh, with uh, regional uh, political uh, positions of power does not occur uh, in the same way as it does not only here in in in, in Holland but in uh, in Finland as a whole I will give you the floor shortly, Osa, but I, I think that Roger had a commentary. He, he jumped up with the <laughs> Europe of the regions. <laughs> no, uh, there is a saying that uh, uh, the, the best defense is to be offen offensive. And I think that is what we must do also with, with this regime. And that, therefore I was so pleased when I listened to the foreign minister and he talked about uh, seminar which will be held in Hague next next year. That is very important and that, that is continuing something that we started in the early 2000 when Elizabeth Nauclair was head of the administration. I think we had our first seminar in Geneva and I never forget it because I had only been head of government for a couple of weeks when I had to speak in front of 
very high level diplomats. So it was a little frightening. But I think that is the way we have to go. We have been in New York, we have in Brussels, in Stockholm, Helsinki, and now we have to continue to inform and, and discuss with other people and also to, to say that Åland can be a, a good arena and uh, the Peace Institute of the Åland Island is a, a perfect uh, organization to, to speak with if you want, want to have advice and practical advice on how to arrange such things. So I think to be offensive and to try to spread the, the word. Also, how do you think about it uh, now that you follow European discussions, you follow the legal discussions, um, and you're writing your thesis, you're almost ready, I think. Uh, so you are going to be an asset as a person uh, and an expert too. Uh, so how, how do you think about the Orland issues uh, and the future uh, possibilities? Um, well, one uh, aspect uh, that comes to mind, uh, there are quite a few, of course, but uh, when uh, advocating the Åland example, um, I think that uh, it uh, is important in a way to show uh, states, perhaps, that they don't need to be afraid for sovereignty reasons. Uh, I, I'm thinking sovereignty is... a uh, uh, an elusive concept. I'm uh, looking at fr it from a legal perspective, but it's uh, always different to, to pinpoint. And today, one can say perhaps that it's made more hollow. Uh, competences are transferred to the EU for us, for instance. States are losing uh, sovereignty. They are losing areas to to decide on, in, in, to put it in a very simple way. Uh, but um, one, uh, a state wouldn't need to feel like that, perhaps regarding the demilitarization and neutralization, but rather as a confirmation of the sovereignty. Um, there it is, black and white. Um, it, Finland is uh, sovereign, so to speak, and has, for instance, the duty to protect it in time of, of war. Mm -hmm. um, Mm, well, that was my comment at this so, stage. I, I think it's an interesting reflection because what you're saying is that, uh, again, we have this uh, duality. What is a limitation of the sovereignty is at the same time a confirmation of the sovereignty uh, and a confirmation which is in fact repeated uh, each time there is an activity uh, for instance, the Coast Guard questions uh, uh, pa passage of a research ship, which, which happens. Um, and I think that is interesting. And, and one thing that has impressed me in, in my research is that when we have reviewed these um, occasions of temporary mistakes, or, or it's not a pattern really, uh, first of all, I, I would like to say that uh, it's mostly Western countries. Um, it's only Western countries in the past 15 years, in fact. It has to do with uh, NATO activities in the Baltic Sea, I believe. Um, so it's interesting to, to realize this um, a little bit counterintuitive for some uh, fact that that the interest of the, of the Russian Federation, the interests of the Western powers and Finland and Sweden, in this respect, in the demilitarization of the Olan Islands, in fact, have coincided to a large extent, which is not something that is usually spoken of. We, we, we prefer, in, in most cases, to see the polarizations rather than the common interests. One, one thing is this fact of, of very seldom um, violations or uh, perceptions of violations, and they are analyzed by the, the, the ministries responsible, the Minister for Foreign Affairs and the Ministry of Defense. And I have not found any example of any country <laughs> or any uh, responsible authority who have questioned the demilitarization in this process of examination. So, so um, this is another way of, of looking at the transparency. Instead of keeping everything secret, there is a press release that there is a, a sus, sus, uh, how do you say, suspected violation and there is an inquiry. 
Um, but I would like to turn a little bit to, to conflict resolution and, and what does it really mean? And we have heard so many times at the Peace Institute this anecdote which says it could be, our, our conflict could be resolved if you were Sweden and we were Finland. And, and it's a way of saying, you know, don't bother with us. Uh, this is not going to work. It, it, it's not relevant for us. And, and sometimes I have this feeling that it's really an unwillingness to cope with the problems of trust, with the horrible past experiences. How, how do you see it, this uh, difficulty in, in um, actually sitting together around the same table? I think one has to bear in mind that when the Åland question was settled 100 years ago, that generation of Ålanders, they were very, very disappointed. They didn't like the solution at, at all. So one must take considera into consideration that it takes time. And I think that is the, the lesson to be learned, that uh, every, everything cannot be fixed immediately. You have to give it, give it time and to, to have trust in that it will be so. Then that, that, I think, is one of the most important lessons from our example. And there are a lot of other also idea, things you can, can choose from it. But uh, I think when there is a conflict and there is a high tension, that it's very difficult to get this message through to the to the parts, because they are so eager to get their solution, and of course. But uh, the Holland example is that if you, you make a, a deal, a, a treaty, then no one can get everything and uh, no, no one can be totally without something in it. So there, there must be something in it for, for everyone and there, you have to be patient to let the time do the job also. I would say two things. First, I would very much uh, agree with you and, 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 and also to say that uh, uh, the argument that our neighbor is not Sweden or our neighbor is not uh, Finland uh, really is not valid in the sense that uh, Sweden and Finland in 1921 or for that matter Sweden when we... Uh, uh, allowed for the peaceful separation uh, uh, of Norway in 1905. Uh, were completely different countries, of course. And if you look at the debate at that time, uh, you had a number of voices saying more or less the same thing about the need to use our military forces in order to defend our national pride and so on and so forth that you hear in... Uh, in a number of other places uh, uh, today. Uh, the, the second is that we should, of course, be uh, humble. We should not believe uh, that uh, solutions uh, from uh, one part of Europe or one part of the world uh, can be uh, exported and immediately uh, applied uh, uh, in other parts uh, of the world. But we should insist that uh, the lesson that uh, diplomacy uh, and negotiation can work, and diplomacy and negotiation and compromise can lead to sustainable long-term uh, uh, solutions that, that benefit uh, uh, all parties. That lesson uh, is, uh, is still valid. And then if we can do something to export uh, a conviction that, that, that diplomacy and negotiation uh, actually can, uh, can work, then, then we, should, uh, we should do it. Yes, also, how do you think as a researcher around this? So you're writing a doctoral thesis, and I don't think there has been a doctoral thesis on the demilitarization since 1928. And it's, it's remarkable. It's truly remarkable. And a little bit it shows 
um, how, how uh, poorly we as researchers have, have taken care of this issue. Uh, and also perhaps how poorly it's understood uh, within academia as, as such. How do you think about it? Uh, you mean conflict resolution? Yes. In, uh, well, um, I just want to say that uh, in general, I think uh, I can just uh, subscribe or support what uh, uh, Minister Rydberg just said. And I think that in all, uh, all uh, uh, events of conflict, it's always very important to, I return to confidence building measures, uh, to look at tools uh, which can be quite, uh, not have a wide scope to start with, but it's important to try to uh, pinpoint what possible small steps one can start with uh, in the form of confidence building measures. Um, Concretely, concrete tools that can then be built on. Um, yes, I think I'll stop there. <laughs> which means, uh, as I think of it, that uh, the, this type of seminars, which brings together not only those who are formally parties, but if you adhere, as most at least the international lawyers do, that this applies as uh, general customary law, uh, to all countries, it should mean that this should be an open <laughs> invitation to all countries, this type of, of discussions around the demilitarization regime, which can be touchy at some points, um, are, are very important and very welcome. And I think this is how I read your comment about uh, the plans in The Hague, and there have not been uh, that many uh, such occasions. Roger, you wanted to add something? Yes, one of the confidence building elements as I see in our system and the relation with the Finnish state is the, the so-called contact group between the government and the and, uh, foreign minister and also the Peace Institute. And it was Roger Jansson, I think, who is sitting here somewhere, who was the invented that element in this system. And I think that has been worked very, very good and can, in, in favor both for Åland and for Finland because we want the system to, we want to have the possibility to rely on the system, and the foreign minister is very happy to have a good example to show to the world, of course, because that is also good for the, for the picture, picture of Finland in, in, the, in the world. And uh, Finland has good, good ambitions, as Sweden has on the international arena, and there Åland can be one small example to, to use. And in that respect, uh, another uh, proposal that has been made recently by, by MP for Orland in the Finnish parliament, Mats Lövström, whom I also saw somewhere here, um, he, he proposed uh, recently that such contact groups should be uh, created at all spheres of government. Uh, so, which means that um, you would have a similar uh, cooperation between Helsinki and, and Mariehamn in, in all respects. Um, however, if I would, as, as a Peace Institute independent representative, have, have a, a view on this, I would really like um, to have both uh, the officials, the government officials' uh, cooperation, but also quite uh, regular political input, because it's one thing to have this um, cooperation at the level of governmentals, and another thing to ensure that there is top political leadership. Uh, and this is one of the lessons I take with me from the Olan example, that you can have the brightest of lawyers and you can have the brightest of, of diplomats, but if you don't have the political leaders who will back that solution, as Brantig did, as uh, President Stolberg did, um, as the, the, the leadership of the League of Nations did, uh, it doesn't work. So my, my, my uh, final question about this is how, we don't have the League of Nations now, um, and which means that we are 
really relying on the ambassadors here. Wouldn't you agree, uh, Roger and, and uh, Osa? Uh, you are one of the ambassadors or the ministers. <laughs> Would you like to comment first, perhaps? Well, actually, we have, uh, we have much more. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have uh, developed during the past uh, century uh, a number of instruments uh, uh, to deal uh, with uh, with the settlements of uh, of disputes. Everything from uh, mediation to uh, negotiation to the use of uh, peacekeeping uh, forces, uh, for example. So. Uh, it's the problem is not uh, the lack of uh, of instruments. The problem, the challenge, uh, is to mobilize uh, when needed the political uh, will uh, to use uh, these instruments. Uh, and of course, as you say, for political uh, leaders uh, to uh, mobilize. Uh, uh, support uh, and support sometimes for uh, for difficult uh, decisions instead of uh, mobilizing uh, a popular support for uh, for easy solutions i think that's a uh, common challenge that we face in uh, in many places uh, at this time mm -hmm. do you want to add anything more no, I, I just sometimes I think wonder if 400 years ago uh, CNN would have been here with their cameras and filming and sending out around the world. Could this solution have been possible? I think it would have been much more difficult. But at that time, you could use time and it could take the time it, it needed to find a good solution. Now everything is much more much more stress in everything that is made in, in the world today. And I think it's, it's one of the problems we have to de de deal with. Mm -hmm. uh, be before uh, taking my, my final question, I was wondering whether there is any question from the floor, from the ambassadors. You don't have many, many chances of, of really asking here the experts. Um, is there a question that you'd like to, to address to the Speakers, you can do so informally, of course, afterwards, but still, I want to give this chance. Uh, otherwise, I don't see any hands. Diplomats are informal. <laughs> But, but there is, uh, I think, perhaps a very important question, at least for the Orland Islands, a very important question. And that is the link between uh, the demilitarization and neutralization and the sustainability goals. Because Orland has made sustainability, uh, and it's part of the centenary anniversary, uh, a key issue. Uh, and of course, it's, it's partly a political tool, gaining uh, recognition uh, in a, a new arena of uh, politics, uh, that is environmental and sustainability politics, but it's also a genuine concern, as I understand, in uh, retaining uh, this fantastic uh, natural environment and a worry about a Baltic Sea which is not in a very good condition. So, is the demilitarization and neutralization an asset for the sustainability goals? I don't know, uh, actually. Uh, what I know is that it's very good to see uh, Sweden and Finland uh, and the other Nordic countries uh, Competing, uh, competing about uh, who is best, who is doing uh, the most uh, for uh, for sustainability. That's a very healthy type of uh, of cooperation. Um, and if Orland can play uh, a role also in uh, in that uh, competition, uh, so much the better. We can be proud that we are the smallest uh, nuclear-free zone 
in, in the world. <laughs> uh, before, I will give you the last floor, Olga. So, Osa first. I think I will have to uh, just join the previous speaker and say that I don't know uh, on this topic. Uh, I think there are uh, probably some effects that uh, could be discerned, but that I would have to look into before saying anything affirmative on that issue. <laughs> You're a politician, you can say lots of things. Uh, yes, I would like to say a lot of things on, in this issue because uh, war is the worst pollution. One can, one can think of that is the extreme pollu pollution and, and waste of resources, both human resources. But uh, ever since I became member or chairman of the Peace Institute, I have tried a little to to get peace movement closer to the, the, the environment movement because I think the biggest threat we, we face uh, for, uh, for, for the peace in the future is the climate change because when people are starting to be starving and the migration will be much bigger than it is today, there will be a lot of tensions in, in Europe and all all other, other, also other parts of the world. And there I think uh, demilitarization maybe can play a role because I think one has to be very creative to, to solve those upcoming situations which are coming, I, I am fairly sure. And uh, I think those people who are, have to move sooner or later, they have to go somewhere. And, and the, the situation in Europe and in the world today is very violent and negative against uh, refugees. So I think this is a very sad situation can can occur. So I think maybe the demilitarization, the demilitarized zones where people ha can go and where they are, are can feel secure and not and the surroundings know that they are not a threat against the surroundings and the surroundings are not, the region are not, are not a threat against them. Because this is one of the biggest issues that, that we have to focus on global level, I think. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we have uh, just about uh, reached the end of this discussion. I would like us all to give an applaud to Deputy Minister Rydberg, Osa Gustafsson, uh, soon doctor, and uh, to Roger Nordlund for participating in this discussion.